Father, we just thank you today for the opportunity to open your word. We know that your word leads us and guides us and helps us see the right paths to take in life. And that's what we pray today as we open our hearts and our spirits to receive from you that you would do through your Holy Spirit at work within us. Lead us and guide us according to your purpose, your will in Jesus' name. Let the church shout a good amen. Come on, clap your hands and thank God for his word today. So good. So good. Well, we've been in this series, and we'll wrap it up today, called Make, Make Room. And I'm going to close today. Just want to get, plant this in your, in your hearts and in your minds. I'm going to uh, close this series today by opening up our altar area across the front and really asking anyone and everyone who really wants to make room in their lives for God to do more, exceedingly and abundantly more than you can ask or think in our closing worship time, I'm going to open the altars and just invite you to come and stand. Get as close to the stage as you can and, and just press in with us into God's presence because I believe that God wants to really seal this these last few weeks that we've been looking to God's word, believing God for, for more in our lives and our response to God, making room for him to do just that. So that's how we'll close out this series today. We open talking about making room to prosper. Because God's word teaches us that God wants to prosper us. And then we also talked about how that that's inextricably linked to God's purpose for our lives. God wants to bless us. God wants to prosper us. God does have a good purpose and a good plan for our lives. Can I get a good amen today? And so God is good. And his unchanging plan is to bless us so that we can be a blessing. God wants to bless our lives so that we can live our lives in such a way that we honor God and that our, our lives are a reflection of him and that our uh, lives actually are a blessing to others. And so with that in mind today, I, I want to get real honest. I want us to get real honest today. Because if we're going to move into that understanding fully in our lives, if we're going to make room for God's blessing in our lives. We have to make room for the areas in our lives that are a struggle. We have to be open and honest with God about our doubts and our fears and our unbelief. See, maybe you want to believe today that God is good. Maybe there's something inside of you that so wants to actually not only believe, but see the goodness of God. But you have all of these unanswered questions in life. You want to trust that God's plan is good. But if you're honest, you just really don't know how. You've done that before, but somehow with all of the unanswered questions in your life, hard circumstances that you find yourself in, you're just not sure how. Maybe today something inside of you longs to trust God, to know him, to actually feel his presence, to experience real peace again. You want to believe today that, that he's with you and that he's for you. You want to pray knowing that God listens. Hello, KSBJ people, yeah. right? You want that in your life. But if you're honest today, you're just not sure anymore. Maybe he exists. Maybe God is sovereign and in control, maybe God cares. You used to trust, you used to believe, but when you look at yourself in the mirror, your life feels like it's in shambles. Am I talking to any real people today? Here's where you find yourself. More questions than answers more questions than answers. Have you ever 
had these kinds of questions roll over and over in your mind? God, why did this happen to me? Why me? Why have you chosen to bless me in this way? Right? Why was my child born with a disability? Why did I get pregnant and then lose him or her? Why did I get laid off or fired from my job? Why has the cancer come back? Why have my children left the faith when Proverbs tells me, raise up, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're older, they'll not depart from it? Why is it that I struggle with chronic illness and daily pain. You want to believe God is for you, but where you find yourself today is called a crisis of faith. The good news today is this, you are not alone. You are not alone. This room is filled with people who are either in a crisis or faith or have come through it because of the faithful hand of God on their lives, on our lives, and God's hand is on you. God's hand is on you. Do you know that the Bible is full of stories of both doubters and people processing doubt? And there is a distinction. There are God-haters, right? There are God doubters, and Jesus wrestled with both kind. And what I'm talking to today and who I'm addressing in the room is people with honest doubts. Can I tell you, all of us have honest doubts that we deal with in life over and over and over again. We're not God haters. We are not doubters of Almighty God, but we do have things in life that cause us at times to doubt the goodness of God. I want to share a story today of an encounter between Jesus and a parent who watched his child, a father who watched his child actually suffer for many, many years. And it's recorded in Mark chapter 9, verses 21 through 24. Jesus asks him this question, this dad, how long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father, and he replied, since he was a little boy, the spirit often throws him into the fire or into the water, notice, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us, the father says, and help us if you can. He's speaking to Jesus, the son of God, and his cry from his heart is this, have mercy on us, help us if you can. I want you to notice Jesus' response. What do you mean? If I can, Jesus asks. Anything is possible if a person believes. And the father instantly cried out. This is a deep cry agony from his innermost being, from his soul. Jesus, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Maybe that's where you are today. Jesus, I do believe, but help me, Father, overcome my unbelief. Imagine, if you will, can you go there and get your mind around, if you're a parent, this father's pain? If you love your kids and your kids are struggling in any area of life where they're experiencing pain, a, a true father, a true mother will always take on the attitude, hey, let me carry that. Father, take it from my child. And if someone has to bear it, put it on me. And so he's wrestled with seeing 
for a long, long time, his son, his child, who is now grown, struggle with this evil spirit, suffering and, and daily anguish. And after trying everything that he knew to do, here's what he said to Jesus. If you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And I think about this struggle and how it plays out and how we can actually frame it and apply it to our own lives today. And it's simply this, when life is hard, think about this in your own life. When life is hard, it's hard to reconcile the pain we're feeling with the image of God we're taught to believe in. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. And yet there are times when we don't look out on our circumstances and bear witness through our circumstances to the goodness of God. How many have ever wanted to punch somebody in the face <laughs> when they said to you in response to your how you're doing, they said, I'm blessed and highly favored of the Lord. And you wanted to punch them in the face because they were so flippant with it. It was just sort of a something that they said and they didn't mean anything by it other than to say God is good all the time. All the time God is good. And your experience in life right now seems altogether different than what you've been taught, what you've heard, blessed and highly favored. God is good all the time. All the time God is good. And it just doesn't square up to what you're experiencing in life. What happens? Jesus commands the spirit to leave the boy, and it does, and he falls prostrate. And here's what happens. Verse 27 says that, that Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. And here's the beauty of the story. This is the all-encompassing grace of Almighty God at work. The boy was healed, and his father was too. The boy was healed, and his father was too. Jesus drove the evil spirit out of the boy and a hopelessness out of the father. I want to tell you today, if you have hopelessness in your heart today about a current situation, circumstance that you're facing in life, Jesus is the answer and he's big enough for you to bring to him your hard questions, your doubts, your fears, your unbelief. And so maybe today you can relate to the boy. And maybe today you can relate to the Father. Or maybe today you can relate to both. And I know you're tired, but I also know that the God of all hope can renew his hope in you. The God of all hope can renew his hope in you. As God was working this message in my heart, and this is a very personal message for Dean and I, I was reminded of an Instagram video that I saw earlier this year, or late last year, I can't remember, but my mind immediately went to it. And I thought about the endearing response of this little boy to his father and how that truth speaks to us today through their exchange. Check it out on the screen. No, you hear me? I'm not, I'm quaky, I'm tired. I worked hard at school. Okay. All right, so what? You don't want me to mess with you tonight? No. I'm clean time tired. You're not going to wrestle here in a little bit? Well, may maybe. Oh. If I start getting cranky and tired. Yeah, and maybe you're a little cranky and tired today because of all of the struggle that you're dealing with in life. Right, and that's a cute exchange and all of the rest, but here's what I want you to see today is you may be cranky, 
You may be tired. You may be working with everything that is in you to try to right the wrong, to try to bring a solution to the problem that you're facing. And, and I wanna ask you today this question. In all of that, have you chosen to actually walk away from the Father? Have you thought within yourself, you know what, I've got to get over being cranky and tired to stay engaged with the Father. And can I tell you, that is the very opposite of the heart of God. God doesn't want you to walk away and figure out your doubts, your fears, your unbelief, and then come back to Him in perfected faith. He wants you to come in faith along with your doubts, along with your fears. He wants you to engage him face to face. And so I ask you today, are you willing along with your doubts in the midst of your fears with all of your hard questions to believe again? I wonder today, are you willing to wrestle with God? Are you willing to wrestle with God? Wrestling with hard questions. Check this out on the screen today. Real doubts and deep disappointments doesn't deny your faith. Did you hear that today? Wrestling with hard questions, coming to God, with real doubts that you have in life about your situation. Bringing your deep disappointments to your heavenly father doesn't deny your faith. God is okay and invites and wants you to ask him, God, where are you? Don't you care? Why aren't you doing something? This doesn't seem fair. Have you had those questions within yourself? You know the best person to ask these questions, first and foremost, is Almighty God. God, where are you? If you're feeling that, ask Him. Don't you care? Why aren't you doing something? This doesn't seem fair. Only the good die young, right? Aren't those the lyrics of the song? There are times in our lives when life seems really, really unfair. And there is a stark contrast between God is good and where you seem to be in life. Again, you are not alone. Do you know that a third of the Psalms that were written are actually songs, are prayers recorded by people in deep and agonizing pain. That's a third of the Psalms. Listen to Psalm six. David writes, have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. How long, Lord, how long? This is David who had a heart after God who's questioning God about the anguish that he's in. He's saying to God, God, how long is this going to last? How long am I going to feel this way? I'm worn out from my groanings. All night long, I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. Anybody been there? Can you feel that pain? David is exhausted. He's depressed. He feels alone. God, I've cried so many tears, I can't cry anymore. And it's not that he doesn't believe in God. God chose him. But what he's doing is what we must all do with the tension of where we are in hardship 
and the truth that God is good and God is faithful. Do you hear this today? There is always this tension that cycles through our lives in hard times where we have to try to reconcile the hardship we're in and the goodness of God. And that's where David is. He's wrestling with why God? Why God who has the power to change circumstances hasn't changed his. This father cried out. This phrase is used four times in the New Testament. He cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. You know who else cried out? The Bible says in using the same phrase, cried out, Jesus cried out on the cross two times. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As he suspended between heaven and earth for the sin of the world. And then finally, he cried out again. And the Bible says he gave up the ghost. Jesus is actually preaching a message from the cross to those who are gathered, who know him at its foot as he quotes Psalm 22 and the words of David, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And when you study this phrase, what you find is this. It's likened to the cry, the screech of a raven. And then Jesus teaches about the ravens who have no barn or warehouse to store their food, but that God provides for them daily. And then he goes on to say, and how much more does he care about you? How much more does he care about you? Maybe just maybe God knows something about wrestling with hard questions that we don't. Maybe God knows this powerful truth that's so helpful for us. And it's this, wrestling requires embrace. If you're gonna wrestle, you can't walk away. You gotta stay in the ring. I said, if you're going to wrestle, you can't walk away. You've got to stay in the ring. You have to personally engage someone when you're wrestling. You cannot wrestle without personal engagement. It's full contact. It's full contact. Come here, Jacob. You look like a wrestler today. You got this mustache working. Come on, look at this. Then this look like a, 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 a professional wrestler on TV. Come on, somebody. Somebody give him the mic to speak into it and to taunt and to, right? And if we're going to wrestle, this guy's a fireman. How many knows that he could take me down? <laughs> Only because he's a fireman, right? But if we're going to wrestle, it means we have to personally engage. Come on, give it to me. We've got to engage each other, right? We got to go for it. Oh, it's getting serious, he said. Come on, give Jacob a hand. Would you do that? But think about this. If we're going to actually engage these struggles that we're in, in a way that leads us to a place of healing and health and hope, we have to be willing to actually wrestle with God like Jacob who held on to the angel of the Lord and said, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. You hold on to God with the strength that you have and you contend for God's blessing in your life. (laughs) 
and you see wrestling with God can cause you to grow stronger in faith, not weaker. It's actually when we walk away without wrestling with hard questions that we grow weaker in our faith. And by the way, your doubts and your unbelief do not offend God. He welcomes them. Why? Because God understands your pain and he actually invites hard questions. God wants you to ask him the hard questions, not walk away. So be willing to pour out your heart to him. And here's what will happen. He'll actually meet you right there in the pain. He will meet you in the pain. Last week, we talked about Habakkuk and how that Habakkuk 2.2 says, write the vision, make it plain that a herald who reads it might run. And, and we love that. And we celebrate the vision of God for our lives. And we we get on that bandwagon of, yes, oh, this is awesome. God has a vision. God has a purpose. God has a dream for my life. But I think one of the things that we have to stop and realize is that the name Habakkuk actually means to wrestle and to embrace. It has dual meaning, to wrestle and to embrace. And we have to have the whole counsel of God. We cherry pick scriptures, don't we? I said, we cherry pick scriptures to make Christianity look and feel like it's all rosy all the time. And there are never challenges or problems. When you open up the whole of, of Habakkuk chapter one, what you find is Habakkuk, a prophet chosen by God, is actually in full on complaint to God about the crisis that's playing out among God's people, Israel. He's wrestling. How long, Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen or cry out violence, but you do not save. And on and on it goes in chapter one. So what Habakkuk teaches us is this, wrestle out your doubts your fears, your questions, your confusion, then do what Habakkuk did. He stopped and listened. Chapter two, verse one, proceeding, write the vision, make it plain. Habakkuk made this decision. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. So I take all of my doubt, all of my fear, all of my questioning, all of my wanting for a solution to my problem and I wrestle it out with God. I give it all to God. And then when I've exhausted my heart, I've emptied my heart to God, then I stand like Habakkuk stand, stood. And I understand the principle of wrestling and then a transition to embrace. I will stand and listen to what God says about my complaint. And I want to say this this morning, the only way to move forward in life is to make room for God's answer to your complaint. You've got to make room for God's answer to your complaint. And that's Habakkuk's response. Because God did not say, I'm going to deliver them now. Like Jesus did the boy, and the father who had struggled for years. God said to Habakkuk, things are going to get a whole lot worse before they get better. They're going to get better, but times are going to get tougher. 
And then, and then, and here's Sabaka's response. It wasn't bitterness. It wasn't rejecting God's word. Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. This is a bleak picture of the current circumstance that Israel was in. And yet here's Habakkuk's response. In spite of all of that, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. And can I tell you, when God chooses not to heal, when God chooses not to answer your prayer exactly the way you pray it, when you don't get the dream job following being let go at the job that you had currently had, when your marriage doesn't come back together, can we listen to what God has to say about that? Can we receive it in faith in the midst of our doubts and come to this point of maturity as followers of Jesus? I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. You see, wrestling with doubts and embracing God's answer leads to deeper faith. Think about that today. It's not just wrestling with doubts. It's being willing to embrace God's answer. We can learn to trust him when we don't feel him. Believe in him when he doesn't make sense. Follow him when we don't know where he's leading. Many of you prayed for our family recently at the passing of my mother and she lived 91 years years, a long, incredibly blessed life in terms of length of years. <clears throat> and yet the pain of that is, is very real. It's so, it's weird really, honestly, because it's, it's processing through it. It's, it's the, the morning of that has hit at really strange times in different ways. And sure, on one hand, it's the, well, she was nine, one year. Yes, absolutely. But we have, we're meant to process grief. Did y'all know that? Like that's some, that's the, what God, something that God gives us that we, we have to, it's a way that leads to healing and it takes different lengths of time for different people. And at strange times, I'll just have a, an emotion come on me. And it's, it's like, but th thank God I know what it is. And I just, I don't try to hold that back. I just, I process that emotion because I know that's gonna lead to healing to a better, to a better place. Just process that. And, you know, my mom wanted life to be very different than it was her last 30 days on earth. Like where she was was the last place on earth that she wanted to be in level two skilled nursing because she could no longer stand on her own or transfer her to a wheelchair. And she absolutely, I can say this, liberally to this. She hated being in that season, that situation, because she had lived so independently for so many, come on, 91 years, right? <clears throat> and I know her struggle those last 30 days because I heard it in her voice. She didn't want to be in a nursing home. But in that period of time, it was her only option. She had to have professional care. And I was taken by 
something that happened at the visitation and the funeral in Indianapolis. Down at the casket as our family were welcoming so many visitors that came that knew mom, that had impacted her life. Comes a nurse, and I know she's a nurse because she was still dressed in her scrubs. And she introduced herself and said, I was one of your mom's nurses these last 30 days. And she, I know this, it's a 50 minute drive, which in Houston seems like a sneeze, but in Indiana, it's like a 50 minutes that, we just don't do that, right? It's like you go through a lot of cornfields and everything else to get where you're going if you go 50 minutes. But she drove after work to come and to pay respects to our family and to say to us, in these last 30 days, your mom had a powerful impact on my life. Now to come and tell you that. And she told me that so that I could share with all of us this. No matter the season that you're in, as hard as it may be, if you are willing to wrestle with God and listen to what he is saying, right there in the midst of that place where you would rather be anywhere else in life. God's purpose and God's plan can come through you to be a blessing to others around you. In Jesus' name, and to God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Would you clap your hands today and thank God for that? We're taking extra time today, and that's okay. Paul prayed three times, Lord, let this thorn be removed. And he listened to what God said. God said, my grace is sufficient. That is to say, God did not remove the thorn. And here's Paul's response, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And I might add in the Lord, my God. Come on in the Lord, my God. Stand your feet, if you will, all across the room. Maybe you're in a crisis of faith today. Crisis in the Chinese language, there's two letters. One letter stands for danger. The second letter stands for opportunity. And can I tell you today, we can choose in this moment of a crisis of faith, two things, danger, I'm going down, life is over, or I'm gonna wrestle with God, I'm gonna pour out my heart to Him, I'm then gonna listen to what He says, and I'm gonna embrace it in faith and believe that I will see the goodness of God work through His purpose in my life, in Jesus' name. And Father, we pray this today. Or oh, every person over every circumstance, over every situation this morning that's represented in the lives of your people here. Now I pray today over the next few moments that we would choose in our hearts to do business with you, O oh God, by taking a step of faith, coming to the altar, standing, pour our hearts out to you and trust that you will speak to us, that you'll meet us in the pain and believe that you have a good purpose for our lives now and in the future. In Jesus' name, the altar's open. You're welcome to come.